Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 13th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, the what sometimes seems intentional confusion among candidates around the FY22 deficit number. Second, what the university should be looking for in a new long-term president. Third, we mostly agree with a new report from the Alaska Policy Forum on how to rein in Alaska healthcare costs. And now, let's join Michael. Today we start off with uh, maybe the elephant in the room. I don't know, the confusion around the fiscal year 22 deficit number, and Brad asks, is that confusion intentional? So let's talk about this. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I've been asking uh, a lot of these numbers. You're seeing these numbers be talked about by a variety of uh, critters out there, you know, politicians and things like that. Uh, And you ask the question, is it intentional that there's a lot of confusion around this number? Let's, uh, Let's chat about that. Well, I've, over the course of the past couple of weeks, I've talked to a lot of people and and have been getting be, beginning to get a sense that various people are using various numbers with respect to the deficit. Uh, one person told me that uh, the House Finance Committee had uh, circulated a, a look at uh, FY22 at the upcoming fiscal year, the fiscal year that the legislature will address when it when it uh, goes down to Juneau uh, next uh, next winter, um, and that that uh, slide or th- that that set of slides was showing the deficit at about 200 to 300 million dollars. Uh, I understand David Wilson at a Senator David Wilson at a candidate forum over the weekend uh, out in the valley uh, said the deficit was going to be 800 million dollars, um, and 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 those and other numbers that people are coming up with uh, are really beginning to bother me. Uh, the deficit, the current law deficit, and and let's step back for a second. When I talk about current law, I use the same standard. I'm using the same standard that the, that the Congressional Budget Office does at the federal level. The Congressional Budget Office, nonpartisan uh, uh, numbers uh, agency, just trying to get the facts down. Says, look, we're going to look at what current law provides, uh, and we're going to tell you what the numbers are under current law. And then we can talk about policy changes from current law, but we need to have that baseline, what current law provides, before we get into the discussion of of, of various budget changes. So I talk when, when, when I look at the Alaska budget, I talk about the current law budget. What does the current law uh, provide? Uh, and and what's the what's the deficit as a, re, as a result of that? And it's fairly simple to to understand. Uh, we've got uh, traditional revenues, which are oil revenues and and existing taxes that have been been around uh, corporate and other taxes that have been around for a long time. We've got that uh, bracket of 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 money on the revenue side. Uh, we've got um, uh, the the POMV now, the SB twenty six POMV. Um, and and here's where the here's where things start to break down. The the it, it's you, you can't just take the POMV and say that's what current law provides uh, as revenues. Right within the same statute that SB 26 exists in is the is the the PFD statute. Right and the PF and the and the current law for the PFD says you shall distribute 50 percent of of income calculated in the way the statute provides. Uh, for the dividend. So 
to calculate what government gets out of the POMV, you have to take first take the SB26 calculation, and then and then minus uh, what what by statute goes to the PFD, and then you have what's left over for government, and that's what that's the current law of revenues. And then and then what C CBO does with spending is they just take uh, uh, spending under uh, in the in the last budget cycle and inflate it by or adjust it by inflation, and then you have have the spending side. Well, when you do that for Alaska, when you do the calculation of the current law uh, uh, budget, the budget under current law, you get a deficit of two point you know three billion dollars, two point two seven billion dollars, half the budget uh, is or half the half the spending plus inflation um, is is in deficit. And I, that's an important baseline. I mean, we can all argue about how we're going to fill that. You know, some people want to fill it by cuts. Some people want to fill it by cutting the PFD. Some people want to fill it by partially fill it by oil taxes. Some people want to fill it by, you know, uh, upstreaming uh, uh, local property taxes from the boroughs back up to the state. Um, some people want to fill it uh, by uh, uh, spreading the tax burden across uh, across uh, fairly across Alaska families. Uh, we can all argue about how we're going to fill that budget deficit, but we need to have a common baseline uh, of where we begin. And, right. and the current law baseline is important to, to allow Alaskans to understand what we're confronting. And I think, I, think, I think we're seeing people fudge on that. I mean, so the $2 billion of this or the, two, the $200 million or the $300 million that, that Alaska finance uh, is uh, is sending out to representatives and people like Mike Prox uh, up in Fairbanks talk about um, that 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 just assumes completely assumes within the starting budget that you're just going to cut the PFD. That, right. That's how you get to 200, 200 300 million dollars, and and so you're you're starting you're you're giving the baseline budget number already embedded in it a policy choice. You're not telling Alaskans. Really, what that policy choice is, you're just starting with it with that policy choice, and then saying, "Well, we got to find 200, 300 million dollars uh, uh, right. uh, beyond that." Well, and this is what we call in the sales game. We call that the the presumptive close, right? I mean, we're you know, you don't even you just assume that this is you know, oh, yo, you you, you want to buy that? Yeah, you you just you talk as if it's already assumed that they're going to buy it. So what you're saying is they're already assuming that the PFD is going to be gone, and they just don't want to tell you it. So they just you know, it's a presumptive thing. Yeah, exactly right. And 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 so they're trying to bias the conversation. I honestly don't know where David Wilson gets eight hundred million dollars from. I, you, you that that must assume uh, some cuts in the PFD. I tried to calculate it and that is that really would assume taking the PFD from the statutory level of three thousand down to seven hundred and fifty. It assumes a twenty two hundred. Uh, a 2250 cut uh, in the PFD. That's how you would get to an 800 million dollar deficit. So I don't know if he's, I don't know if that's what he's assuming or, 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 or something else. But all of these people who are talking about something other than 2.3 billion are doing exactly what you're talking about. It's the presumptive close. They're assuming that their particular policy angle uh, or their particular policy approach is adopted, and we'll just, and we'll just start from there. Uh, and go on. That's not being fair to Alaskans. And frankly, I think it's giving Alaskans a false sense. Those who hear this, I think they're getting a false sense of, well, we're sort of close. We can get there, you know, 200, right. 300 million dollars. We can figure out how to how to deal with that. They don't they're not being fair with Alaskans and telling them the situation we're really confronting. Um, and and I think I think it to some degree by not being transparent with Alaskans by not being fair to Alaskans we're they're not realizing Alaskans aren't realizing how deep the cuts would need to be uh in order to um even remotely start to start to get a handle on the cuts need to be in order even remotely to get a handle on uh, on closing this budget gap so sure. it it's it, it's a concern a deep concern that I'm developing as we as we go through this campaign cycle. Well, it definitely underplays the the urgency of the situation. I mean, you start talking about a two billion dollar deficit versus a three hundred million dollar deficit, and I mean, I mean, there's some serious you know there's some serious concerns there because then people think, oh, like you said, it's just oh, it's no big deal. We could cut our way to that. It's only a couple three hundred million dollars. We could find those cuts, not realizing that means all the PFDs and all the other stuff, and it assumes probably some other cuts as well. 
So, I mean, it, 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 yeah, it doesn't make any sense. You've got to have that standard basis to work from. Yeah, and that's why that's why Congress, uh, uh, that's why the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, uses current a current law uh, budget when they talk about the budget because they want they want those who follow the CBO and they want Congress to confront the issues that that are really out there. They don't want to let them slide and use and and as you use the phrase, use the presumptive close to assume that they're going to get their way on certain things. They want. They want a transparent, open process about uh, about what Congress is facing. We don't have that in Alaska. I mean, Ledge Finance, which is supposed to be our CBO since 2017, uh, when they made this unholy uh, uh, decision to move the PFD from DGF, uh, designated general funds, over to UGF and, and mix them in with UGF, they, they've made the presumptive close. CBO or, or Ledge Finance has made the presumptive close uh, uh, since 2017, and and so the legislature, you know, you got you got young legislators out there uh, who who were not there before 2017, going, yeah, well, you know, the the deficit's tough. It's 200, 300 million dollars. You know, we got to figure. out. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> you're assuming the PFD goes. You're assuming. You're just assuming away a statute, a a, a law that's on the books. Um, and ledge finance, I think, has been has been a huge part of the problem. Uh, in, in terms of misleading Alaskans and misleading legislators uh, about what the situation is. Well, so this, ca- this campaign, we need to be honest with Alaskans. So zero it down then for us. If we pay the – because I, I, I had some of these conversations yesterday with, with, uh, with a couple of candidates. Um, so zero this down for us. If the statutory PFD is paid – and all the things fall in the right direction, and we get the revenues that are projected, and everything else. What will the deficit be? You know, not, you know, give it to us within a hundred million dollars. You know, in your estimate, what the what the deficit would be? So the deficit is the difference between spending and revenues. Spending uh, at uh, at 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 last spending level plus inflation, capped at spending plus inflation, which is what generally what those who talk have talked about a spend, spending cap use. Uh, spending would be $4.6 billion. Revenues would be $2.3 billion. Um, and, and that's, and so the deficit is $2.3 billion. It's fi- it's 50%. Those revenues come in part from traditional, uh, the traditional revenue sources, about $1.3 um, uh, billion of that. And then about a billion dollars of the POMV draw, the SB26 draw, that's left over after paying the P, uh, the POFD or the, the PM the PFD, so so that adds up to revenues of about 2.3 billion dollars. So we're talking about we're talking about a deficit of 2.3 billion dollars, 50 percent of the budget, if you observe current law. That's the starting point that that people ought to be using in their campaigns. Anybody who uses a camp who uses a, a deficit number different than that. Is as you just as you described earlier is using the presumptive close. They're 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 assuming some policy choice not yet made, not yet reflected in law, some policy choice that's adding additional revenues uh, to that number. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. See, I'm guilty of it as well. Yesterday, I said 1.8 to 2.3 billion dollars. So, I mean, you know, depending on how you want to figure it, but it's a big number, and you know, that's the thing. They just, I don't think a lot of, I think a lot of these politicians immediately start to get spooked when you start talking about, uh, you know, a, a, a deficit of well uh, over a billion, approaching two billion dollars. They just immediately their 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 brains go cannot compute. I mean, they. Because they don't have an answer for that, they, they don't. But that's 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 what Alaska is facing. We're facing a situation where we don't have a good answer, and people are trying to trying to dodge that. I mean, house finance is the worst, and for and for people like Mike Prox to, to be repeating that, I think is just horrible. Um, uh, for for people to say it's just two hundred to three hundred million dollars. You know, and say that's the that's the deficit we're facing. I think that's just I, you're misleading Alaskans. We do, you, you we're, we're we're giving them a false sense. Candidates are giving Alaskans a false sense of confidence, um, and, and creating a situation in which you know to to produce that two hundred million dollars, they then you know eliminate the PFD. Alaskans say, well, you didn't tell me you were going to eliminate the PFD. 
I mean, you told me the, the budget deficit was only $200 million. Right, right, exactly. Well, we didn't tell you we were taking all your money to fill the majority of that gap. Sorry about that. We, you know, didn't you know? Weren't you paying attention? That's what it's, <laughs> that's what it's all about, right? The number Prox was using was the $300 million. I, I missed part of that in the beginning, apparently. Is that is that what you're saying, Brad, that $300 million was the number that he's using right now? Yeah, he was He's uh, uh, was asking a question in a Canada forum and, and used a uh, uh, Two hundred million, which is, I mean, I guess if you round uh, liberally, you can get to two hundred million as the deficit instead of three hundred million. But, I mean, that's so. So, but, but he, he, here's what's going on. I mean, Mike gets something from House. He's not on House Finance himself. He gets something from House Finance from Jennifer Johnson um, and Neil Foster, uh, and and it says deficit's two hundred million. Now, assumed in that is that you eliminate the PFD. Um, but you know, the deficit's two hundred million dollars. So you got it. You got a a fairly new representative. House Finance is, you know, it's it's the finance financial body of the of the of of the organization he belongs to, of the state house. And you and you get something that says it's two hundred million. I, you know, I can understand how you get there, but but legislators, even those not on finance, need to be digging into these numbers and need to need to understand where they're getting led. You know, because you get down to Juno, you've said that you said back in your district that the that the deficit was 200 to 300 million dollars. You get down to Juno, and and you start you know digging into the numbers, and and you realize that that means the elimination of the PFD. Well, the problem is you're already out on the record. Your district saying it's 200 to 300 million dollars, and they've got you, but they've got you by the nose, and they're leading you by the nose to say, well, it means we've got to eliminate the PFD to get to that number. Right, exactly. Well, and like I said, I I mean, I hate that kind of presumptive close because, as you said, many people will not, you know, they're they're not following this closely enough to know. So when they hear one of their legislators or one of their perspective, you know, especially if it's somebody somebody supposedly in their camp uh, say it, they're not gonna they're not gonna question that. They're not gonna be uh, they're not gonna be saying, oh well, the, you know, wait, that's two billion, not two hundred million. Um, <laughs> And, and you're exactly right, Michael. I mean, part of the problem is the number's just way too big. And we've just dug ourselves in such a deep hole. And, and, and the number's just hard to comprehend, hard to get your head around, and hard to think through the solutions that it's going to take, it's going to, take to close it. But a lot, we need to be honest with Alaskans that that's where we are. Yeah, that's that's the that's the culmination of all the decisions we've made through this last decade of putting off things by 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 draining the savings just a little bit more each year. That's where we are. That's where we've come to. And that two point three billion dollars is we're out over we're out on the high wire over the Grand Canyon and there's no safety net underneath us. Right. I mean, there's there's no savings left that we can fall into if we do, if if you know if we just fall a little bit short. So it's. We've got this election cycle needs to be about honesty, transparency with constituents. So Alaskans understand when we get to the election date, the policy choices they're making and choosing. Are we electing somebody who's going to go down and cut a heck of a lot? But we realize there's going to have to be some revenues to go with it. Or are we electing somebody who's going to say, well, we just have to go down there and eliminate the PFD? I mean, we, we need to be honest on what the baseline is so Alaskans are making very honest choices when we come to Election Day. We're into number two of the uh, weekly top three. Number two uh, is, of course, uh, talking about the university, what the university should be looking for long term in their interim presidents. And uh, Brad's got some uh, thoughts on this, as usual. Brad, uh, what... Uh, what have you been thinking here? What's uh, you know what's what's your thoughts as you look at the list of candidates here that are potentials up there? Well, let's let's divide let's divide the issue into two parts. One part is what they need for or what they're going to do for an interim president and 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 what they do for a long term uh, president. I think there I think there are two different two different routes for that. Uh, right now, they're confronting what they're going to do for an interim president. Uh, to, to last uh, during the period that they engage in the national search uh, for, uh, for naming a new long-term president. And, and it's possible that the interim president will have an advantage, an inside advantage on being named the, the long-term uh, president, but, they, but they, they've said they're going to go through a separate uh, analysis, a separate search 
uh, for for the long term president. The the interim president uh, is the decision on the interim president is pretty well baked. They've named uh, five finalists, uh, all university, uh, either current or former university insiders. Uh, Michelle Rizik, who's the who's the current interim president, the current acting president, uh, I think is the probably the proper title. Um, she uh, uh, has served in various capacities uh, for the university system uh, over the last several years. Uh, Dana Thomas uh, is uh, 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 somebody who's been on the inside at the university. Uh, he was he worked for the university system. Uh, was the Interim Chancellor at UAF at the Fairbanks uh, uh, Fairbanks uh, University uh, for a while. Kathy Sandine, who is the current uh, pre uh, Chancellor at uh, UAA. Uh, Dan White, who is the current Chancellor at UAF. Uh, and Pat Pitney, who was the longtime Finance Director uh, for the university system before she became uh, 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 the OMB director for Governor Walker and is now the head of the legislative finance division uh, for the legislature. But prior, prior to those last two uh, positions was frankly in the, or relatively in the same position as Michelle Rizek was uh, at the university in charge of in charge of finances and uh, and and legislative uh, outreach uh, for the university. So they've got they've got five finalists, all of whom are are insiders and. And they're going to pick. I mean, because they're, because they're all in, insiders, they're going to pick somebody uh, who's an insider uh, to serve as interim president. Right. I think where I focused is, and, and as I say, that's pretty well baked in. Where I focus is what they ought to be, what the criteria ought to be on the on the on the new president, uh, long term president, permanent president. They name at the end of the current search process, and I think the choice there. Uh, is between an outsider, uh, somebody who's not been part of the university system uh, historically, not uh, somebody who uh, has, has baked in institutional knowledge, but also baked in institutional prejudices um, uh, as, as, part of the, uh, as, as part of the system. Uh, and, and the choice will be an outsider between an outsider um, and presumably somebody uh, from the inside, uh, probably uh, the the leading candidate will likely be who's ever named interim president, uh, but also uh, 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 per possibly uh, some of the others uh, who are candidates for interim president, but don't but don't get that don't get that spot. I think I think the reason that they ought to focus on an outsider uh, as as the new long term president once they once they do the search uh, is because the university needs an outside look. Uh, I mean, everybody, everybody who's the candidate for interim president has sort of grown up in the three university system. Uh, they've sort of grown up with uh, uh, with uh, you know, biases or prejudices or positions or or takes on what the university system uh, how to be, how it ought to be structured. Um, and as we know, we can't afford the university system we've got going forward. Right. So I I, I think it needs to be somebody who has who comes from the outside and frankly somebody. Who has a history of 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 resizing, restructuring, redeveloping uh, a university? When you have a corporation that crashes, uh, when you have a corporation that goes bankrupt, or when you have a corporation that's near bankruptcy, or a corporation that's on the rocks, you bring in a restructuring expert uh, to somebody who's who's been around restructuring before, somebody who's seen how to how to how to you know bring down costs, somebody who's seen how to how to restructure uh, uh, marketing and restructure the revenue side. That's who you bring in to run a corporation uh, and get a get a get the corporation back up and running on its feet. Right. That's that's the type of person I think we ought to be looking for long term for the university. Well, and I think that this runs parallel with what we're seeing in the legislature. Right. I mean, the definition of insanity is sending the same group of people back again and again and again and assuming that they can fix the problems that they helped create. I mean, really, that's what it comes down to. You need that fresh perspective because, I mean, if they didn't have the foresight to see the issues that they were creating with their actions, how in the world are they going to fix the current problems? Uh, and that's the same kind of uh, same kind of logic we can apply to the university at this point. Yep, exactly, exactly right. I mean, it's we've got people who are baked, who who've grown up in the system, baked in the system, have have prejudices in the system, have have commitments they may have made. 
in the system or at least feelings that they may have developed in the in the current system we need somebody we need a restructuring expert to come in and look at the system afresh and and as i say somebody hopefully who's had experience uh restructuring uh universities because they're unique but restructuring universities before to uh to bring them more in line with the uh, current financial situ- the current financial situation maybe it should be university president brad keithley i don't know i mean maybe uh you know <laughs> That would be a little that'd be a little scorched earth for some of them, but you know maybe that would work. I don't know. Um, well, I, I I definitely have ideas coming in. Yeah, but but it uh, but in all honesty, it needs to be somebody who's done this in a university system before, and there are some examples out there. It needs to be somebody who's done this in a university system, who's dealt with declining revenues, who's dealt with an embedded cost structure, and 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 in a university context knows how to in a higher education context knows what levers to pull and come in and uh, and and uh, bring the costs down and stabilize the revenues uh brad keithley's our guest alaskans for sustainable budgets although i think it's highly doubt uh, doubtful brad that they will look outside like you said this is a very closed loop incestuous system i think it's uh you know highly unlikely that they'll be bringing in that fresh blood so to speak because that protectionism is uh is alive and well in those kind of systems for sure uh we're down to the last uh, three or four minutes here uh let's crack into number three a little bit uh there's been a new opinion piece out with the alaska policy form bethany markham wrote a piece of the peninsula clarion talking about health care and you say you agree with what she's got going on yeah sometimes i don't agree with policy forums sometimes i think uh, uh they've, they've gone off in the wrong direction for example uh, uh their solution to the state revenue problem is a sales tax which uh, frankly, just just ranks right behind the PFD in terms of its regressivity and uh, and shifting cost of middle and lower income Alaska families. But in this piece, Bethany focuses on an Alaska policy forum focuses on one of the largest segment of costs that we've got in the state, uh, uh, both in, in state government as well as is the, as in the state general and state economy in general, and that's health care costs. And and she references a piece that uh, a report that has been uh, recently done for Alaska Policy Forum. I've read the report. It's a good report. Uh, there are several good uh, thoughts in there about uh, about how to do it. And frankly, I think I frankly I think this this is a one area uh, of of diving deep uh, that that the state that the state would benefit from going into into cost structures going into the into the healthcare cost structure medicaid is our second largest uh, expenditure after uh, k through 12 uh, and and medicaid costs are 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 tremendously high part driven by the fact that you know we've opted into uh, more uh, optional services medicaid optional services in this state than than any other state so we're trying to provide more services to 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 our citizens than uh than and frankly we can afford uh through medicaid but also because medicaid costs the cost of those services as uh, setting aside the number the cost of those services are high this is a good outline of how to of how to start dealing with that people should go take a look at it i'll put the link in the chat room uh, it's over at the Con- uh, peninsula clarion uh 56 higher our medicaid expenditures are 56 percent higher than commensurate states it's pretty pretty mind-blowing when you look at it this is going to eat us alive i mean between the educational costs what you were just talking about with the university not to mention k through 12 and the medicaid medicare and health care costs being borne by the state those are the two biggest line items in our budget we're talking billions hundreds of millions and billions of dollars uh, and you could see the direct line increase if you go back and look at the budget over a 10-year period. You could see that those are the largest and fastest increasing uh, sectors of the budget time and time again, Brad. Do Michael. I mean, and, and and we haven't done it over the last decade. What we need to do is do a deep dive into K through 12, which is which is basically looking at the BSA and the factors by which the BSA gets adjusted. Uh, for various school districts around the state. Last time we did that was 2008. Last time we took a deep dive was 2008. And we need to take a deep dive into Medicaid costs. And we need to take a deep dive into university costs. Those are the three biggest uh, cost drivers. I think I think the, the benefit of the Alaska Policy Forum uh, outline is they're identifying the costs we need to look at in Medicaid uh, and and they're identifying, you know, sort of a roadmap to what the what the deep dive 
uh, would look like. We need we need to do the same thing on K through 12. The fact we haven't done it for the last uh, for the last decade uh, is an indictment, I think, of the legislature and of the administrations we've had during that period. Parnell, Walker, uh, and now Dunleavy. The fact we haven't done those deep dives. Uh, is has set us up for the situation that we're in, which was a you know a 4.6 billion dollar budget. Now let's be honest, the deep dive on Medicaid, wh- where's a lot of that cost going to? It's going to doctors, <laughs> and it's going to to health to healthcare professionals. Um, and so the deep dive is going to say we've got to take doctors' rates down, and the medical community, a top 20 percent community, is going to be screaming about that uh, and resisting it. It's not an easy fix. Uh, but that's, I mean, that's where you've got to go. Just like the NEA, just like dealing with a, with the teachers union on the on the K through 12 side, you're going to have to deal with the docs in the medical community on the on the Medicaid side. And if you, but if you don't deal with it, that's where we are. That's 4.6 billion dollars, and we're and we're going to have to talk about revenues. We're not going to be right. able to talk about spending. Right. Well, and unless somebody is brave enough to take on those two. Uh, I mean, education is kind of the third rail. The university and the K-12 system is kind of the third rail of politics now that the PFD is on the table already. Uh, And, uh, you know, that's going to be a very unpopular position, but we're faced it. I mean, we're up against it. You know, $2 billion deficit, $2.3 billion deficit. If we don't do something, uh, we just we can't continue. There is no safety net. I like that idea because you're right. There is no safety net. If we slip here, we fall a long way. I mean, we fall a long way. Yep, exactly right. And 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 revenues. If we don't get the costs, if we don't deal with these costs, uh, uh, revenues are going to be the only way to, to to close it. We're going to have to raise a massive amount of revenues from from PFDs, from ta- I mean, PFDs alone won't do it. Uh, from from PFDs, taxes, oil companies, um, uh, every other every other revenue item known to man. I mean, that's if we don't get the costs under control, and we haven't. Uh, then we're going to have to we're going to have to deal with this uh, uh, through the revenue side. I think that the benefit of the of the Alaska Policy Forum report on uh, healthcare costs is is giving us a roadmap on how to go after uh, healthcare costs. We need a similar roadmap, frankly, on K through 12. We need a report that says this is how we go after K through 12 costs. This is after we how we go after the BSA and how we go after the adjustment factors on the BSA. And then, frankly, we need a new president at the university that does the same thing on the university side. If we don't do that, and again, we haven't for the last decade. If we don't do that, then we're talking about closing that 2.3 billion dollar gap with revenues. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, have you been talking to any of the candidates, Brad? Have you been listening or watching? I know you, you mentioned Prax and some others on the candidate forums. Anybody uh, Is anybody coming out and saying, uh, you know, talking about the real numbers or talking about good ideas in your opinion? Well, there's a, there's a difference. I mean, you, you've got people who are talking about eliminating the PFD, uh, Zach Fields, uh, closing the gap with uh, eliminating the PFD. Um, the with good ideas, no, I'm not. I'm not honestly. I'm not hearing people uh, uh, talking about being honest about what it's going to take on the on the uh, uh, on the revenue side or on the on the spending side to get it down. I mean, people are talking in generalities. We've got to get a balanced budget. We've got to you know get our fiscal house in order. But very few very few people are are, are talking about 2.3 billion dollars and how they're going to how they're going to close that. I mean, they're sort of wishing it away. Some, some, you know, some hope that uh, that oil prices are going to rise. Well, oil prices would have to go over a hundred dollars a barrel uh, to close it. it. They close at about uh, thirty dollars, uh, thirty million dollars per dollar uh, of increased oil prices. So we're about seven dollars above. Oil prices are down about seven dollars on average uh, above the spring forecast. So that's raised about uh, two hundred and ten million dollars. Uh, but that's not going to close a 2.3 billion dollar gap right. uh, uh, on their own. So uh, we, we've not yet gotten to that point. We have to confront the problem, 
the two point three billion dollars and then talk about the solutions. I'm the, not seeing not seeing people do that yet. The first step to admit to uh, fixing a problem is admitting that you have a problem, right? I mean, that is the dependency cycle is you've got to admit that you have a problem. And it seems like that's something that many people are not willing to do. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, thanks so much for coming on board and joining us this morning. As always, thought-provoking stuff. And, of course, we can find you out on the web and on Facebook. Final thoughts before I let you go. Well, Michael, thanks for having me. Uh, Ask your candidates what they see the deficit as. If they don't say $2.3 billion or something close to that, they're they're as you said they're doing the presumptive close and ask them where their presumptive close is but that's the number that's the, that's the number we need to be dealing with all right brad keithley thank you my friend appreciate it well that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from alaskans for sustainable budgets thank you again for joining us remember that you can find past episodes on our youtube soundcloud and spotify pages and keep track of us during the week on facebook and twitter This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.